The second most common question that I hear in real estate, besides what do you think is going to happen with the real estate market next month, next week, next year, is how much does it cost to build a custom home right here in the city of Toronto? And I have to tell you, this used to be something that I could answer intelligently, but since COVID, pretty much all assumptions and costing ranges have gone out the window, to say the least. So I've invited Paul from Avio Fine Homes, a custom home builder, to come on here and give us the framework that he walks his clients through when they cost out a custom home building. This is a very nuanced topic. There's a lot of insight that I've gained from this. You'll understand how to think about this, how to pick a builder, how to pick a site, and all the different considerations you have to make when going through the process. My name is Vass, and I'm a full-time real estate broker right here in the city of Toronto, and I help investors and families navigate the craziness of our real estate market. Enjoy the video. So the main reason for wanting to talk to somebody like you in particular is because, because both of us are accountants by training. The one thing I find the most difficult is that everybody talks about numbers when it comes to either renovations or construction very loosely. Yeah. And uh, it used to actually upset me because somebody's like, hey, my buddy built a house for a buck 50 per square foot, meaning that $150 yeah. to build a house. And yeah. uh, now my background, I have a construction background. I have built residential and commercial out industrial uh, as my own projects. I don't do it regularly. I've always used the general contractor for all these things. And mm -hmm. uh, if it's one thing I've learned, the inconsistency between people quoting and saying different costs, it's just wild, right? So yeah. somebody says 150 bucks per square foot and they, they didn't tell you about the other 150 over here. That's a different pile of costs, but they didn't include it. So part of why I want to talk about this is because over the last 18 months, I've had a very difficult time giving people advice or even guiding them in a framework manner in terms of what costs are. And this started with COVID. So it started actually with renovations. So somebody, I have a client move into a, uh, that buy a detached house and they're like, how much is it to cost the, how much will it cost to finish the basement? There was a time when you could say a cost per square foot, whether it's 40, 50, 60, 70, $80 per square foot, depending on what they were trying to do, there was a way to quote it. All of that went out the window. And I used to have like, two, three different general contractors I used to work with. The, the reliability of quotes out the window, scheduling mm -hmm. reliability out the window. So I've stopped doing it. I, I say, I just, I simply don't know because mm -hmm. for one, I can't trust the costs I'm being told anymore. That's mm -hmm. one. And number two, obviously people want an easy answer to a very complex question. What is the yeah. cost per square foot? And then they expect $147 and 33 cents. Like that's not possible, right? Yeah. It, and this is what I wanted to talk about. And I will yeah. preface this with the context of why I think this is so important for people now to understand this. I know somebody who quoted and started a build in 2019. It was a custom house, 3,500 square feet and the 905. And it was supposed to come in at about $350 per square foot with decent finishes. This is 2019 or 2018 pricing. They finished this build uh, four months ago. And obviously COVID, lots of impact with delays and they were waiting, not sure what to do. The whole thing came in at just over 500 per square foot. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the reality, right? Yeah. Now, on the flip side, you still see people starting projects and they're building now. But I know that these are people, usually it's mostly end users who were in queue with a specific builder from two years ago where they mm -hmm. put themselves in and now their build starts. So these people are starting they're end users. They're not in it for the money. They just want a brand new, nice home that they've been dreaming about their whole life and they're going through with it. But everybody, everybody else is kind of like on the sidelines. But effectively, people still do want to build. And with all these new different bills coming out, Bill 23, build more homes faster and whatever else, yeah. not necessarily with custom homes, but with just in general, building is never going away and people have questions about how much does it cost to build. So I figured I'd let you maybe walk us through the process of how you educate people because you have a very difficult job of trying to explain somebody that, hey, yeah. I can't give you a precise cost, but at least here's what it looks like and here's what you need to think about. Yeah, no, everything you said makes total sense. And, and I've heard the same sort of things. I mean, uh, it is um, a common question, probably the most common question. And um, I think uh, giving a little bit of grace to the homeowner or the potential client is them, they're asking that question because they don't know enough about the process to ask other questions. And I, and I, and I thank you for this opportunity because this will allow me to kind of uh, expand more at length um, rather than, you know, the, the, the short social media posts, let's say that we see a lot of, uh, you know, these little snippets of information that 
you know, we, we, we try to put out there. Um, so yeah, it's an extremely lo loaded question. Um, there are many details, uh, like you alluded to, uh, the variability is, is extreme as well. Uh, so the main answer to a question of what does it cost is always, it depends. Uh, and so our, our job is in our processes, we review the details with a potential client to establish the expectations also. So, you know, they need to be honest with what they've heard or what they think or what they want it to cost. Uh, and, you know, to, just to ensure that we're in the same neighborhood so that the process can begin with designing because all this has to be based on good information, quality information. Um, you know, ultimately it's just an estimate until there are actual construction drawings. And, you know, some might say, well, why do I have to spend money to get to that phase? It's because nobody can tell you anything for, for certain. There's it's, it's like you Googling, what does a car cost? That is, that is, people can wrap their head around how generic that is. Uh, and, and with housing, it's that much more because it's that much more options, that much more dollars. Um, so until there's a detailed the, the construction drawings, right? Uh, there's a detailed list of allowances. So finishes, fixtures, um, so that we could prepare, and this is what we do, is we prepare a lump sum guaranteed quotation. So based on that drawing, based on that list of finishes, based on the site conditions, this is what we're guaranteeing it's gonna cost with some allowances added on there. And those allowances cannot be guaranteed yet because the actual hardwood flooring hasn't been selected, the actual tiling hasn't been selected, the cabinetry, you know, so we're, we're still, we have numbers there, but they're not guaranteed because uh, the precise details have not been selected yet. Um, so I'll get more into that, uh, but that's just, just, you know, the, the rough um, the process is that we, we, we gather information, we try to ensure that we're both in the same neighborhood of what things, what they want it to cost and what we think it's gonna cost. Uh, and then it can move forward to the next step of doing the design. Um, and so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll just yeah. jump in just to give some context because yeah. this is something I dealt with. So in 2019, I built an industrial building and uh, the final cost ended up costing me, <clears throat> I think just under $400 per square foot, but it was, it was mm -hmm. pharma grade type of uh, stuff we're talking about. So yeah. when we were coding this, we came in, I think at about 320 per, per square foot. And everything you said is so correct about without plans, you can't do anything. So you got to get the architect involved because at that point, there's so many little things that came up. And I'll just give you examples uh, where we wanted to build it on site because of runoff of water and the way that the town wanted things. We had to put the building in a certain place of the lot. It was a three acre lot. They yeah. wanted it on this part. That yeah. changed my setback from the street. The second I changed my setback, then they had to put in a brand new road, which was at this elevation. For the runoff of water, they wanted my building to be at a certain elevation, which I didn't account for, I don't know how many trucks of gravel we had to bring in so that we can yeah. lift the building up, the foundation, the footings. So, so yeah. many different things changed. And then obviously something as simple as how long my driveway is going now from the road to the building changes too, because... Yeah. <laughs> like to get asphalt in and to get everything prepped. Like we're talking tens of thousands of dollars more. So just, yeah. I, I thought it, I'd add it out there as just co color for people because yeah. this is so common without plans on the specific site, yeah. we're all guessing. So it's, yeah. it's a very, uh, it's the, you have to do it. Number one step. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's also a fluid process. Like you just alluded to there. Once one change happens, it's a domino effect to affect other changes. Um, so, so really what we're trying to understand, I'll, I'll give a f the main, um, let's say buckets of, of items we want to understand, and then I'll get into actual, you know, what, what some costs are for like a typical house, um, you know, like around the size that you had mentioned. So, um, number one is what stage is the project at? You know, we're approached sometimes when homeowners have, uh, actual, a, a design, uh, and actually we're, we're dealing with this now where uh, a homeowner is in through, through the committee of adjustment phase, which means that they're applying for variances, so a little bit bigger, wider, whatever than the bylaws allow. Um, and, and so we're coming in and looking at the drawings and saying, okay, this is what we think, not just from a cost point of view, but 
even, and I'll talk about this a little bit more as well from, you know, can we actually construct this the way it's designed? Can, are there things that need to be improved? So sometimes we're handed them at that phase and other times clients don't even have a property yet. And they want to understand, is this even something that I, I even start? Uh, you know, before, when they approach someone like you and say, you know, this is a property I'm looking for, they might say, well, what can I actually build on that property? So um, what stage is, is it at? Number two, um, what's being built? Okay, so size-wise, um, smaller homes are more per square foot than bigger homes on a, let's say, apples to apples basis uh, comparison. Um, it's just economies of scale. Now, when you get into the massive homes, you're going to have other things that really inflate the cost as well. You know, indoor pools, golf simulators, uh, elaborate landscaping, things like that. So, but just on a, on a pure size point of view, uh, the smaller the size is going to be more per square foot. Um, is it a bungalow or is it a two-story? Bungalows are more per square foot because you have, let's say a 2,000 square foot bungalow has the same foundation as a two plus two, 4,000 square foot, two-story, um, same roof. Um, so it is actually more per square foot. Uh, design style, um, each from the modern to the, to the traditional, let's say, can be expensive, let's say. But you can also have e economical uh, uh, finishes and, and design. So, you know, how big are the windows? Uh, you know, you know, you see some modern homes with some massive, massive curtain walls, uh, corner windows. These are all, you know, expensive in terms of windows, but also structure. Um, you have on the other end something really elaborate. You know, French classic. You have detailed moldings, precast, and uh, you know, expensive limestone and things like that. Again, so it's not just what what is the design. What is the details of, of the design? Um, the building envelope, is it, is it a high performance home? What, I'll get into that a little bit more. Is it a net zero home? Or, you know, is it built with solar panels, things like that? Um, where, the next big bucket, where? Um, wh why, why does location matter? Well, site servicing. Is it a uh, rural property, a farm? So does it have a septic tank? Uh, does it have propane? Or is it, you know, an infill in North York where, you know, you have all your site services there, your sanitary, your water right at the street. Um, that also impacts design fees. Uh, location might have a different uh, approval process. So, you know, city of Mississauga, Richmond Hill, more steps to follow. So that means more time the designer is going to charge more, architect's going to charge more. Um, you have maybe labor cost differences when you know there's more travel involved or are there local trades here to Toronto that are traveling to Muskoka let's say to, to build a, an elaborate cottage um, next big bucket quality so I mean by that workmanship um, not not finished level so whatever is being built is it done properly is it attention to detail there you know you can walk into a a 5,000 square foot custom home versus a 5,000 square foot big home by a, by a big builder in a subdivision. Night and day in terms of the details. Like I, I, we've been into open houses and we're like, is this house finished? <laughs> like, you know, this, this wall, the, you know, this, 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 this small portion of the ceiling is not, is not even painted. Uh, look how rough the edge of is, banisters or, or railing. Like we've, we've experienced this and, you know, there are different, you know, levels of detail that the builder is going to follow if they're, you know, let's say on the custom end. Um, Let me ask you a question, so, yeah. sorry, because I was, so I was walking my daughter to school today and there are two custom homes being built on my way to the school, both massive, yeah. probably 4,000 square feet. And yeah. I was just thinking to myself, I'm watching the quality, right? Because I'm keeping an eye out on the trades because again, I talk to these yeah. guys. I want to know them just in case. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me if I'm nitpicky. So I was thinking to myself, if one of those homes was mine, I would be pretty upset. So one of them, I was just looking the way, so they just framed it. So it's all framed up. I think they have the shingles are about there. Yeah, no, it's not shingled yet, but I'm looking at the way the soffits, the line, like just looking down the line of where the soffits would go. And it's yeah. kind of wavy. Now, 
I don't know. Is it is is it fair for me to expect a straight line like where they have to just kind of maybe shave some of? I think it would be the truss or whatever that that's kind of like where the soffits would go, so that it's a straight line. Or should my expect or am I expecting too much to have like a straight line? I want my soffit to be straight. I don't know. Maybe it's too much, <laughs> but I'm asking a question. Where should my expectation be? It's a custom home after all. But exactly, yeah. And and my brother Vincent, he's the one that deals with um, the construction. Um, He's, he's the technical um, um, side of the company, let's say. Uh, things like that drive him nuts uh, because he is thinking about those things. And, you know, what, what we've seen actually is it's become harder to deal with some trades. And it's directly linked to how much work there is out there. There is so much work yeah. out there that the quality, you know, if you don't have a builder that is paying attention things will be missed because there is more, not just shoddy workmanship, lack of ownership, you know, um, not, not abiding by timelines. It's just like um, we're, we're finding certain trades that are so busy are basically saying, I could do this somewhere else. And, yep. you know, for a homeowner, let's say I can get paid under the table uh, and not have to deal with any of this, you know, professional level, you know, uh, paperwork and things like that. So yeah, my brother is, is the one on site kind of with the angle iron out. I see him with the masonry. He's, he's got, he's got his tapes out. He's, he's, he's measuring. He, he would expect that to be straight. Uh, yes. So. It's, it's yeah. That's why I wonder like how it, it all works and just something you brought up actually here. I want to just mention it. Why yeah. people, need to understand why using a builder because some people think that they can they can general con they can be the general contractor of their own project mm -hmm. and uh look you can be i've done it but here's my learning from that okay if yeah. you're a one-off customer doing a general contracting build and you're calling the trades i promise you two things are going to happen number one your build will not be done on time what mm -hmm. even if whatever on time means it's just not you are always going to be the last customer if yeah. they have a relationship with a builder that they work with on multiple projects, they will always serve as that builder first. And if you're the one-off homeowner that calls them for a roofing job or framing job, you will always be put on the back burner. So if you drive mm -hmm. by certain jobs, you will see trades yeah. there on site yeah. every day. And other ones, you don't yeah. see people. It's a one-off. So something yeah. just people to consider because they don't get it. Yeah. And, and, and what I'll add to that, and actually I was going to bring this up, was... Um, costing what what builders are charged versus what a homeowner is charged are two different things yep uh, a trade knows when he's dealing with the homeowner that this is their first time they know they're going to be spending more time explaining things and and they, they will charge more they also know that the homeowner is not in the business yeah and they know they think they can get more from them so they try there's no you know uh person to oversee things right um I, I know some very good people with some very good, let's say, technical knowledge that whether it's for wanting to do this so bad or they want to save money in their mind by not hiring a builder, um, they've been building a house for multiple years. Yeah. Okay. So I, part of that is, like you said, picking up the phone. It, it's, it's also the coordination involved is, is immense. Uh, you're going to have to stop your job to go to a job site to meet somebody probably every day. Yep. And then you're going to want to be there to watch them work. Or you're going to be hiring people to work nights and weekends because that's what you can afford. Yep. So think about the thousands of hours that it takes to build a home. Now you're just extending all that to all these you know, uh, crews that have one person that's working at night versus four people on a job during the day you know it's it's night and day and there there are so many other things there's, there's risks that homeowners don't understand health and safety wise you're actually now the constructor under the law which means if there's an accident on the site you're responsible for everybody um insurance are you telling your insurance company what you're doing on the site because you actually may not even be able to get insurance because you're not a professional builder their risk is now higher yeah that. Yeah, so there's I, it, there's many components to that. I'm glad we touched on this because yeah, again, yeah. I don't want to discourage anybody from not doing like maybe no, you have no. to get it out of your system, right? Yeah. I had to get it out of my system. I did. Yeah. I learned my yeah. lessons. 
for me now at this point, it's just not worth my while yeah. because again, the savings or whatever savings you may perceive you're going to get, it's going to come in other ways, especially, and I think that the worst of all is it may come in by way of quality, unless you're able to be on site, like you said, keep people accountable. If trades walk off the job, bring somebody else that can come. And sometimes it's time sensitive. Yeah. It, it's a lot, right? Because you, it's, it's, yeah. you're juggling multiple things with the city, with inspectors, with the build, with timelines, with financing. So again, it's, yeah. You have a lot on your plate. It's a full-time yeah, and, job. And like building has changed over time. And, uh, you know, even some of the things I, I mentioned before about net zero and higher performance homes, there are techniques to use to make sure that house is not going to leak water. It's not going to leak air. How do you know what to do? Yeah, you and don't. This is a profession, right? Um, but again, some people try and, and that's fine. It's just that you really have to know what you're getting into. It's not, um, it's, it's, it's not a bathroom. It's not a kitchen. Uh, people I know that have done that are like, I'm never going to do this again. Yeah. It didn't come out well or whatever. Right. Yeah. Uh, so others can pull it off and it looks great. Uh, and, you know, more power to them. Right. Um, so, you know, even in terms of that, like it, it's when we're talking about like the quality level, like, is this your forever home or are you looking to do this as a short term investment? Or maybe this is even a rental property. So really, that that impacts the cost because, you know, you're not going to want the finishes or even maybe you're not going to be too particular with the quality level, right? Um, so yeah, th those are some main buckets. There there are some more. So you know, what stage is it at? You know, what's being built? What quality level, like workmanship level, are you looking for? Uh, when? Okay, so what are your deadlines? Do you have a house that you've moved into or a rental property that you need to get out of? Um, what, what dates is, uh, when's construction starting? Is construction starting, you know, everyone says, I want to start in the spring. But, you know, what we see is people start as early as they can start. When the permits are ready, they want to start. Um, what does that mean in the spring? You know, uh, you have load restrictions on the road. So you're going to have half loads. So that's going to be higher uh, cost for excavation costs. Um, if you're doing masonry work over the winter, you're tarping and heating the outside that that's costly so there's these little nuances that you know i can put a thousand asterisks beside what what i'm gonna say with what things cost and it's still not enough like there's just so much right um what else what what timelines or or, or, or when um like i was alluding to the cheapest usually means you know you're work, you're getting someone to work at nights or part-time and you know that's really no way to build a house uh, to do it and meet, meet a deadline um building over the winter foundation costs you know you have higher concrete costs because you have to put an additive to prevent from freezing um and then what we've seen lately is covid supply chain issues um you know you have let's say um delays but also or exchange changes what 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 you know sorry not just delays but you know um th there's been there's been cost increases obviously through through major cost increase I'm, i shouldn't minimize it um so you know we're at a time in in, in history where you know uh, the costs have shot up 20 30 percent easy right so it's it's always it's always good to know what's your timeline you know no one has a crystal ball to see what's going to happen over the next year you know we think renovation you know demand is going to is going to reduce so there's going to be more let's say available trades and materials uh, but all these things play into what what something might cost um we alluded to it before another big item to understand is what control does the homeowner want so with custom homes you know we we've already touched on it you know we have everything from uh, in the spectrum one end is the homeowner wants control and I'm not talking about going to a, a, a showroom and selecting finishes or colors and things like that. I'm talking about who's selecting the trades, who's paying the trades, like who's in actual contract. Is it a general contractor or is the homeowner um, uh, in, in charge of those things? And that impacts the control, right? That, that means that homeowner is in control and that's going to impact, sorry, the services of of the um, of the builder. So in that case, I would say the builder is a, is a manager, right? They're not they're not the general contractor. They're not in control. 
So a builder there is going to charge differently. They're going to charge th than, than a general contractor because they're charging based on the services they're performing. You know, they might prepare a budget. They might be getting comparative quotes from trades um, and sending those requests for quote out. Um, they might be um, managing the job site for quality, um, providing general labor. There's a la carte services, right? So they could be charging percentage basis of the bill. They could be charging based on time, you know, a monthly charge or weekly or even an hourly charge. Um, the other uh, end of it, yeah. I just want to kind of speak on this a little bit again to contextualize it. So I've had a friend, I think I mentioned this to you. He built a massive home in Richmond Hill. Oh, okay. I can't remember how many square feet it was. And he, he had already done a few builds before with a general contractor. This time he decided to hire a general contractor right. as a project manager. So they mm -hmm. would pay a flat fee. And yeah. uh, again, this is years ago. The flat fee, just to give people context, was at the time $10,000 per month for the duration of the project. I think there were some back-end fees as well. But this is you know five, six years ago. So I don't know if the fee is now double or what it is or how it's done. But yeah. What we found in that, because I was helping him on, you know, just through some of my some of my referrals and stuff, I was on site quite a few times, and I just remember that project. He was just happy to get out of it and sell it, and thankfully he did sell it. The market like picked it up. He ended up selling it for quite a bit of money, but what it ended up costing it was he was just happy to get the money out because there it was over four million dollars with the land and the construction and everything it was a massive massive project, but the amount of deficiencies like with you know just um. Yeah, it's I can't even remember this point. I remember like just with with the brickwork with the masonry. There were so many problems. There was wet spots on the precast. There was chips, and they're already installed. Like, what are you gonna do? Tear all this stuff out? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was just a, a nightmare. But the thing is, because the the general contractor was acting as a project manager, I don't think the quality piece was his responsibility. Yeah, it, it ended up being a compromised project. So yeah. My friend got what he paid for. Essentially, he paid the whatever it was the monthly fee. He had yeah. to deal with all the trades direct. But again, the site it took longer than expected, and unfortunately, the biggest issue is the quality. We we're talking a very about a very high end home that yeah. ended up being with some pretty major flaws that you can't easily fix. Yeah, and and, and you hit it there, uh, which is who is responsible for quality. So you know, I, I could be hired as a manager. I could look for quality issues or ensure good quality. Um, but I'm really just at the end of the line because if the homeowner has decided who they're hiring and what they're paying, then there's only so much we could do. We can tell you this is done wrong, but in the end we can't prevent it because we're, we're just seeing something that's already happened or even while it's happening. Um, so that's a, yeah, it's a whole other ball game when you're talking about a manager. Um, you also have different risks in terms of, um, um, like I said before, uh, health and safety. If, if you're paying the trades, you're probably the constructor. Um, so that means you're going to be needing to get some good trades that are not risky in terms of safety wise. Um, you have to do some vetting there, which the manager could do, but in the end, the homeowner is taking that, that liability. Um, and in theory, that was the well, point. That's why they hired yeah. him because they had worked with that with yeah. that general contractor before where they manage the yeah. project from beginning to end. And they're like, okay, now I'm going to just yeah. need you for the management yeah. services. So we thought, okay, well, if he's getting the trades, we're going to get the same level of service, but it just did not end up working that way. There were similar yeah. trades that were used in multiple jobs prior, yeah. but because they didn't answer to yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's where we ended up. Yeah. So, so that end of the, the other end of the spectrum is when the builder does have control. Yeah. So they're the ones that are, are, you know, deciding who's being hired. There are the ones that are paying the trades. Uh, so when that happens, you know, like I said before, we we charge a guaranteed price with, with some allowances. Uh, you know, the homeowner therefore is getting cost certainty uh, for the majority of the costs because we're taking the risk of the pricing on. Uh, we're taking the other risks on, like I said, about health and safety or insure liability insurance or WSIB coverage for the trades. Uh, we're also able to provide a warranty if I'm controlling it. Um, because in the end, I mean, I, sh I should be warranting it, right? I mean, everything now has been my, my decision, let's say, in terms of how and who would be doing the work. Uh, and when we control that, we can also provide an Energy Star certification or potentially net zero. But that 
has to be backed up uh, into uh, starting at the design phase. It's not going to be something that's um, um, just thought of after, after, you know, everything has to be planned for in terms of those types of builds. Um, and then also, you know, we're talking about like the length uh, of, of detail of our contracts. You know, when we're talking about lump sum contracts, we're talking about 20, 25 pages of uh, these are my responsibilities, but also this is what you're getting for that guaranteed price. You know, um, sometimes we're specifying actual manufacturers that we're, of, of products that we're using. Um, we're, we're using, um, uh, we're talking about um, uh, uh, who's responsible for what, like I said, but when we're, when we're the contractor, we're responsible for most of those things that I mentioned before. Uh, and then obviously what's, what the allowances are including, right? Um, you know, these are the sorts of uh, things that we're itemizing, you know, um, uh, uh, cabinetry, um, uh, door hardware, um, trim, uh, things like that. So we're actually maybe saying this is the, the square footage that we're assuming or flooring, let's say square footage we're assuming, product we're assuming. Um, and that would all be um, itemized in, in a very, very detailed contract. So that that's the other end of it. So one end is homeowner is in control. The other end is like I just ended off there was uh, we're in control of the build. Got it. Yeah. Makes sense. And I guess from, I want to ask actually a question about in the position, like in the situation where you're given full control, I want to understand uh, the payment structure. The reason yeah. I want to bring this up is this is a massive risk. Yeah. Like you, I think you and I have talked, I think to get a house built, you're looking at, you know, 40 plus trades, individual yeah. trades that they're going to come through. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 I've already, I've gone through this in the past. I've gone through small claims court because of unfinished work and all that stuff. Yeah. And this is a real issue, right? And people don't yeah. understand that you're bound to have some issues with this stuff. If like 40 plus trades, that's a lot of trades. Okay. Something will happen most likely, especially if it's your first time. So my question is more on on the money side. So I want to just understand yeah. if I am hiring you as a builder, giving giving you full control, yeah. I know I'm eliminating that money issue because you're handling, that is your problem. We have a schedule or an agreement, I'm assuming, and then yeah. I'm paying you as per that schedule or per, yeah. per milestones. And that's yeah. it. Can you just give me a high level idea of what, what does the milestone schedule look like with payment on a project? So it's it's something that I think is is maybe the biggest fear when 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 a homeowner is hiring somebody is is that they're going to be um, screwed out of out of their money. Let's say um, so. Uh, when we're talking about how much to to, to pay. Let's say uh, when you're dealing with a general contractor, number one is uh, legally uh, you have to hold back ten percent of payments. Um, for for construction liens so what that does is if if one of my trades is not paid and they put a lien on the property as long as you withhold 10 percent from me then it that 10 percent is used to clear the lien and then it becomes my responsibility to clear any shortfall of that of that 10 percent so holdbacks are required i know that some builders don't even tell uh, potential clients about them that's what protects you from having to clear a lien that's much more than that um, and that that liens happen when uh, trades or or suppliers don't get paid by by the the general contractor. Um, it could even happen even more down the road, actually, because some of our subs have their own subs. So if that one is not uh, uh, paid, then you know everyone on top of them is responsible to hold ten and and pay that ten. If someone didn't, then they uh, they're responsible for more. Um, there are deposits. I mean, that, those are common. Um, uh, so let me let me ask let's if we can run through a hypothetical scenario let's say i have a budget of a million dollars to build x yeah, house yeah. and let's say my timeline to build that house is call it eight to 12 months let's just say 12 yeah. months just to be safe how much am i giving you up front and then how much am i giving throughout the process like at key points so okay. at the start i guess to retain you as the builder yeah it, i would say the deposit is roughly 10 percent uh you know we we don't do it the same on every project. It, it really depends on, on the scale of things. Uh, uh, but uh, we do uh, bill for deposits in stages. So it's not gonna be everything due upon signing. 
our deposits are actually at, at, at some milestones as well. Um, but the but the milestones are all for for not the deposits for the actual buildings are all based on progress. So, yeah, performance based, yeah, right? Yeah. So you know, once we you know just list a few of them, let's say so. Um, once excavation is complete, uh, once foundation is complete, once uh, framing, um, windows and roof, uh, exterior veneer, uh, interior roughings, um, interior. Um, uh, insulation, drywall and taping, um, flooring. So there's probably, you know, um, I would say 10 to 15 uh, milestones. Um, so if I was uh, to guess, like, by the time you finish the the envelope yeah. of the, so let's say it's it's sealed. So you have the masonry up, the carpentry and whatever. The inside is still before, let's say around drywall stage. Yeah. At this point, how much of, of project budget have we used up? Is it fifty percent less, more? I I would say uh, I and ballpark. I this so, is again. Yeah, yeah, I would say around around half. Uh, yeah, that's it, what know, I figured. Costs are more front loaded. I mean, like it, it just from uh, I know we talked about this. Let's say uh, offline, but you know, talking about what what people assume finishes are to a project are not what they are. You know, they think they're a lot more. So I, I hear this commonly, which is, you know, I don't need imported marble from, from Italy. Okay. That that's great. But guess what? We're not doing laminate counters anyway. We're doing quartz and things like that. So, you know, you might have, you know, uh, X per square foot for quartz, which is now a standard. Uh, you might have double that for something more elaborate, but you know, not many houses have that. So when we're talking about totals per square foot, it's not really the finishes. The finishes are, are, are you know, a minor component, not, not minor, but they're, the majority of the job is the construction. Um, so, um, you know, I'm commonly asked also, what, what's, what's, what, how, how can I plan my cash flow? Um, the basic answer is obviously, Add more just in case there's there's conditions or other uh, contingency uh, for contingencies things that come about that are not planned for. Uh, but uh, on a very high level, you know, expect to have money available early. Um, you know, we provide billing schedules, but um, you know, homeowners shouldn't wait to get a bill before they get the money prepared. So. You know, in terms of preparing for a build, in order to establish a budget, you know, financing is something that homeowners should really be looking at at the very beginning. Uh, talking to their bank or a broker uh, to understand how does construction financing work? Are they going to use, let's say, an existing line of credit? Um, what we find is some homeowners are not even aware that their bank is going to be told that their house is being torn down. You know, this all happens through the insurance process. Um, so, you know, your bank needs to be made aware of that um, uh, because some banks require there to be no mortgage on the property uh, before construction starts. Others are totally fine with it. They'll just extend you a construction loan and construction loans work the same way. Usually it's, it's based on milestones performance. Um, some banks have a certain number of draws they are okay with. Others say, you call me when you need the money and they come out and they do their appraisal. Uh, you pay, you know, appraisal fees, legal fees, and they forward you the money. Um, so it's important to understand not only the total amount that you're going to get, but also uh, how they're going to be forwarding you that money. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Yeah. I didn't actually know that some banks require you to pay off the mortgage, but I can see that happening yeah. because you're yeah. effectively... Yeah. you're taking the securitization of the asset against the loan away, right? It's just land value at one point. Yeah, even though, you know, the, the building maybe is not worth that much, that, that's not how they see it. And yeah. um, especially what's been happening now through the pandemic um, uh, and even more, let's say, tightening now, there are changing policies all the time. So it's important to have a current conversation with um, with your bank. Awesome. Okay, good. Do you want to walk through these? Yeah. Like I, yeah. Let's do you have okay, because I know we kind of touched on some of this stuff. Yeah, yeah. If you if you go back to the start, let's say I'll just um I'll just touch on let's say some of the larger components of a build and, and, and what things cost. Um I think in order for a homeowner, and this is one of the main things we're talking about before we, we get started with them, is 
what what is your expectation for for budget um what does that include um does it include design fees pre-construction costs like demolition uh you know site servicing like i mentioned um you know gas water uh utilities um is it is there soft costs in there like insurance um is there uh hst uh, appliances, things like that. So what we find is that, you know, homeowners will say, you know, they've talked to people, let's say that have done this, or they've talked to other builders. So I always say, okay, they, they say, you know, we have a, we have a quotation. I say, okay, well, I don't think you have a quotation because you don't, you don't even have a, a drawing yet. Right. So what, what you have is an estimate. So it's, it's usually something that's verbal and it, that means it's, it's very much not guaranteed. Um, so, um, you have to be careful relying on those. Uh, some builders and even some architects and designers kind of lowball what things cost to get a project. Uh, and also be careful talking to friends that have, or family that have done this before. We've, we've talked about this uh, as well, where, you know, um, people like to embellish how well they did with getting a low cost for, for the build. Uh, they also won't include everything um, so some of those things that I mentioned before, just make sure you're looking at like a total project from, from top to bottom. Um, so, so yeah, running through a, a, a sample design. So we have, let's say, we were saying a 3,500 square foot home, you know, um, 416 uh, area code. Uh, so we're talking about major differences and variables, like, like I mentioned from the beginning. So let's say design phase, you know, you have your architecture. You can have a more economical five dollars a square foot or less, and that's going to get you, you know, basic floor plans and elevations. You're not going to get any renderings, uh, or, or let's say, I, I would say even the creativity is kind of limited, right? Um, you have the top end, let's say, a licensed architect that, uh, or let's say, a noted architectural designer. Um, you know, you're talking about uh, over ten dollars a square foot, so. You're going to get um, detailed drawings, renderings, you know, different options, concepts, things like that. The, the main concept of all this is you're going to get what you pay for, and it's going to be a function of how much time they're, they're putting into the project. So, um, you know, right there is a 100% difference in cost, right? Um, I have a question have, about this yeah. specific part. I have a client right now. He's going to be building a custom home. He's going to be doing it himself. Yeah. And um, he... I don't know if you've dealt with this before. He bought the plans off an existing house because, you know, you can buy plans from the existing ones. So they right. found something they really like yeah. from, from the States. And obviously, yeah. I, I don't know how it's going to work bringing that here. He's going to have yeah. his architect or whatever vetted, but he feels that that's one way of just saving money rather than building something custom from scratch. They buy these existing plans. So kind of what's your take on that? Uh, yeah, I, I've heard that the odd time. I mean, I guess uh, number one is to what standard are they designed? You know, what uh, what building code does it include? We have local codes, so someone's going to have to do a code review. Um, what what details are you getting? Are you getting you know proper site plans? Are you getting uh, you know um, a reflected ceiling plan, which is you know your electrical design of of the ceiling and and your lighting. Not, not like lighting architect or, 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 or designer, but, you know, just a proper schematic, uh, not schematic, proper drawing showing, you know, uh, where, where all the electrical connections are going to be and, and where your lighting is going to be. Uh, do you have a and they don't. Plan? No, they, no, they don't. don't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. They don't. I remember now because yeah. I think all you're really doing is you're saving a few grand on architectural design because you're just getting the design. Somebody still has to take those drawings and then do all the mechanical yeah. Electrical. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, and structural. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, I think you might save a little bit, but I guess when you approach somebody to, to take this on, a, a, an architect or a designer, they may kind of be discouraged that, you know, you're, you're, you're a tire kicker or you're, you're, you're really just trying to get the lowest cost. And they, they might not even be interested because they, they have, you know, a lot of potential work and they want to, they want to produce their own designs as well, like, you know, their own creative creatives, right? Um, so I would say it's um, probably sounds better. I, I would say th than than what it actually is. If you want to start, let's say, and we always advise this, you know, start with some some ideas, right? Some some photos of homes that you like. Um, you know, there, there's all these nuances, right? Like, you know, you might want to change the floor plan, 
uh, you have a, a, an elevation of your property that is not like the elevation that they've assumed, right? So you're going to maybe have a walkout basement or you have to have a retaining wall. And so it's like, there's all these little things with custom. Like, I, I really don't think that you're going to really. Got it. Again, again, I agree I, with you. Yeah. Now that I think about yeah. it, I just remember from my own experience. Yeah. Well, at the end of the day, the engineer has to have input. The architect needs to have input. So the whole thing, yeah. Yeah. it almost HVAC, has, it's, yeah. gets recreated anyway. It's just, a, it's almost like it's just a, a glorified concept. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. So yeah, the other cost there, the design side, you know, you, you have your engineering costs, your HVAC design, like we said, but those are kind of standards, but uh, structural, but you know, you're going to, the pluses come in where you're saying, okay, do, do I get the interior design? You know, am I getting all my millwork, my, you know, my, my family room cabinetry, my, my kitchen even, or is that all going to be designed? Am I getting a, a feature wall in a staircase? Do I want to have that drawn for me so I can see it? Uh, those all take time. Uh, lighting, uh, yeah. landscaping, um, things like uh, even, even, even soil. Right, some parts of the the GTA have very poor soil. Like we were actually just experiencing this now, where we had to, you know, it's, it was a site condition. We're on site. There's not enough uh, pressure in the soil, and um, we had to dig even further. So we had to get something something designed there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, shoring shoring is becoming more common. Not not just in infill, but just generally in building. You know, that's where, you know, normally they want, you know, a slope like this when they excavate. And when you're, you know, right beside a, a neighbor, a very small side, you're, you're not going to get that. So they have to put some some steel and, and some wood into the ground. And actually, I think uh, I had a picture there in the next one um, to, to do that. So that that takes design as well. Yeah, uh, that's a current project we have in North York. Um, and then even just uh, actually, sorry, just to back up too, you also have, you know, your pre-construction. So site services, like I, like I alluded to, City of Toronto, 2025 grand. Uh, you have even other areas where they have services right on the road. Yeah. It's actually per uh, per home that they're trying, it's, it's, it's a custom cost. They'll come out and they have to price it. So it's not like Toronto where they're saying, yeah, this is the price for, you know, uh, X millimeter water service or for sanitary. Uh, you know, some places like um, uh, Richmond Hill, I think they they require you know their their department to come out and price it. And it might be over fifty, sixty thousand dollars, right? So right there, you're, you're double or triple the cost. It's it's uh, really interesting. The, this yeah. part I ran into this issue building outside of the uh, the city of Toronto, and yeah. it's funny. I thought to myself prior to it, like for example, hydro is going to be the expensive one because I had to run. 300 meters worth of hydro wire from the main road to where my facility was. Yeah. And that cost me five grand, which was the craziest yeah. thing. It was five grand from hydro one. They give you the first poll for free. And then every second one, I think is five grand. Yeah. But it just happened but, to be where you were, right? Yeah. But yeah. check this out to get natural gas. Holy yeah. smokes. That yeah. was over $50,000. Yeah. And I was like, I, we, we could have, so then you have to go on propane or whatever, but it's, it's so funny how, what you yeah, think those little things yeah exactly. and what the reality is is so different yeah yeah and and like even in terms of the um designated substances right so before you do demolition you have to have a survey of the existing home uh for substances that are are designated because they're dangerous like asbestos uh or lead and things like that and you know usually we've had remediations of like under ten thousand dollars five thousand dollars maybe sometimes there's nothing you know just some around the the the, the floor or sort of the, the wall registers uh we we've recently experienced homes where you know there is um sub these substances in all of the mud in the drywall they mm -hmm. had to they've had to remove all the drywall we're talking about fifteen twenty thousand dollars wow. and that's literally going into the garbage so you can have zero, you can have 20, you know, on a, on a three, 4,000 square foot build, you're, you know, you're at five, $6 a square foot, like right there. Um, municipality wise, uh, they have, like I said, different processes, there might be more fees. Um, uh, and like I, I was mentioning before, the approval processes would be different. So uh, your, your architects and designers might be charging differently for those. Um, you know, pre-construction we already touched on. Uh, in terms of site services and, and the designated substances there. Um, construction, 
Again, shoring is becoming more common. It could be between fifty to hundred thousand dollars. And um, is shoring uh, uh, is that a reflection because of proximity to other houses, or is it soil related? What? Is, why is it becoming this, more? This this one was uh, depth versus uh, versus the neighbor. Mm. Um, the soil was a secondary thing, um, which which was really just um, uh, exaggerating the foundation costs. But there was there was engineering, there was testing that was required, and you know that was not known until we were actually uh, in the excavation phase. I remember I uh, this is not anybody I know, but it was through a friend of mine who told me he was on a project somewhere in the east end of Toronto and this soil pressure thing was an actual issue where they, they realized they yeah. couldn't lay the footing on that, on that soil. So they had to drive a bunch of posts, I guess, like really yeah, deep like pot piles. And yeah. Yeah. And I was, piles, I yeah. was very surprised because it, it did not seem like it was an issue in the past, but I guess it's like, yeah. you didn't, you don't know until you rip the house out, build and then, and yeah. then test. Yeah, no, exactly. And, and I think some areas of the city are, are known more for it. Um, but you know, we we built mostly in North York, you know, also Etobicoke, Richmond Hill. Um, but you know, most of the areas that we've done in North York haven't had this issue. So uh, yeah. this was just something that we encountered here. Um, and yeah, like it, like I mentioned before, is is the home a high performance home? So what that means is, you know, if you think of the home as a system where you know you have a tightly built envelope, which means that you know, uh, air leakage is, is, you know, minimal, if any, uh, because it has better insulation and, and barriers. Uh, you know, your wall system is better. Um, your, your windows are better. Um, it's all working together, ventilation systems um, and mechanical systems. So basically, like, it's, it's no compromises in terms of construction. Uh, that's obviously a premium cost. It's not, you know, a code minimum type, type building, right? Um, you know, net zero, are you, are you going net zero? Like, are you, are you, are you prepared? And net zero is, is generally just saying, you know, the energy consumed versus the energy produced on site with solar panels, maybe wind, but usually solar panels uh, will net out over the year to, to zero. Uh, you might have some fees, let's say for, you, you know, you're, you're hooking up to the grid. So you might have some administrative fees, um, but over the year, you know, uh, what you're actually using on an assumption basis is going to be uh, versus what you're producing is zero. You know, those solar panels and the other systems involved, they, they all have costs. Um, windows, like, I mean, are, 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 are you doing like a vinyl window or are you doing like something more uh, aluminum or wood cladded? You have um, large expanses, like we said, these large sliding doors you're seeing now. Those are obviously premium costs, not just for the windows, but for the structure. Yeah, the structure is um, the big one, right? Yeah. Because people yeah. they'll sag or whatever, and people want yeah. the biggest opening because that's what they saw on Instagram. Yeah, and then it's yeah. like good luck; it's expensive. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, and, and the biggest one, let's say in the news, has been lumber. I, I think the slide before I talked about some of those lumber costs. Um, so you know, we've looked at you know a few of the major items. If you can get some of the like we noticed some LVLs and other engineered products. You know, we had to substitute products because certain yards just didn't have them. Uh, so we had to, to, to get them further engineered to get whatever they had uh, in, in stock or, or at least soon enough that we needed it. Um, so we went from December 2019 to, pardon me, let's say February, um, one and a half to, to you know, a 150 to 300% difference in cost. Uh, the same products to, from December 2019 to August 2022, you know, doubled to slightly over double the cost. Like, you know, yes, the commodity pricing is coming down now. Um, so that will take some time to, you know, hit the lumber yard level, let's say. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, on, on a home, the size that we're talking about, you know, that's, that's $70,000, $80,000 extra. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so... Um, you know, uh, more examples um, talking about uh, on, on the systems ends, right, and finishes. So let's say systems, you know, you have HVAC systems, you know, do you have multiple zones? Do you have heated floors? Um, home automation systems, you know, for lighting, for sound, for security. Uh, you know, some of these systems could be eighty, dollars 
systems. Uh, some of them are more retrofit systems, so you know they're they're much more economical. Um, finish wise, this is like we touched on before uh, a common area where um, homeowners think a lot of the money goes to it, and it, it you you could really go nuts with it as well. But you know the majority of the home is is uh, the build cost is from the construction. Um, but you know that being said. You know there are there were large increases on the finishes too, right? So we saw plumbing fixtures around twenty five or over twenty five percent during the pandemic. Uh, tiling, I just remember one of my suppliers saying, you know, shipping containers used to be X amount, and now they're almost ten times that. Yeah. Uh, so I think those have come down as well now too. But just showing the variability when we're talking about like when an, when an actual product got uh, um, when an actual home got built, um, and and those pictures there are just an example of a heated floor system. I like the herringbone there. That's a nice. Yeah. Where where yeah. is that house? Where was this built? That's uh, in uh, in uh, West End Toronto. Beautiful. Uh, we're talking like uh, a detail like that, right? So you, you know you have okay, you have an allowance or an expectation for flooring. Okay, so how what material is it? Is it engineered? What 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 width is it? What thickness is it? And then you have a pattern, right? So that's all time for for labor. That's that's more than just a standard straight lay. Uh, but you also have more scrap there too. So yeah, these are the details, right? Um, for further on, uh, you have like specialty items. You have let's say um, an elevator. That is, elevators are becoming more common um wine cellars and like i said when you start getting into larger houses you know uh you have these these you know indoor pools and golf simulators and things like that cigar rooms um but but commonly like like even something like landscaping you know pools became more more popular um so that's you know 75 to 150,000 like it really depends which one you're your your what 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 material used to build the pool uh, what your landscaping is around it. Do you have an outdoor kitchen? Uh, do you have outdoor finishes, a loggia with, you know, some flagstone, a TV and, you know, decorative um, fireplace wall and things like that, screens that that retract. Uh, so these are all premium items, let's say, but, you know, what you notice over time is that custom homes, the, the level increases. So not, not only does the building code requirements increase for, you know, energy efficiency and building uh, uh, components and things like that, but, you know, there are things like you said that are, are becoming more popular that becomes an expectation. Well, now I'm spending 5 million. I need to get, I need to get all these things. Right. Um, so yeah, we, we touched on a lot of, a lot of different things. Um, one of the things actually I mentioned before, I didn't get back into like soft costs, right? So something like insurance, like, you would never have thought about insurance, but you know everyone now seeing their 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 auto rates over the last couple of years as an example. Like the insurance market in in, in construction had changed a lot, with you know some some insurers leaving the market. So we saw costs actually double. You know maybe it would be five six thousand dollars for a home we're talking about. Uh, that's now ten to twelve thousand dollars. Like it's double right there on one, that one line item. So. You know, the overall, I would say that, you know, like the cost you mentioned, you know, under 400 a square foot, you know, we were comfortable saying around that number, probably a little bit over that, but, you know, and that was for, you know, a good quality home, right? Nothing over the top in terms of design, uh, you know, good construction and finishes, you know, the North York area, we know well, so, you know, it had some wainscoting, some detailed carpentry there with, you know, some nice baseboards and window casings and uh, and, and, and door casings, um, solid doors, things like that. Um, you know, no shoring, that that wasn't always always happening, like I said, um, no elevator or, or net zero, but just still like a solid build. Like we were, we were okay with that number around the 400 mark. Um, now it's adding all those things obviously that 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 makes it different we're talking a step up in terms of cost right and and, and what what we're what we're providing but like something like that that would have an elevator or or net zero like we're talking about over six hundred dollars a square foot now easy. yeah that now that, that's yeah. totally at the, at the top yeah. end understood yeah. i'm gonna yeah. share something with you i'm looking at the 
Canadian cost guide for 2022 from Alta's group. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this thing. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I've seen this before or from other companies too. And, you know, they're, sometimes they talk about custom. Yeah, yeah, they do there. There, there are massive ranges, obviously. Here. Yeah, so um, it's, yeah. I just wanted to show this to anybody yeah. watching this because yeah, this why this is such a loaded question. So from them, they're saying yeah. that a custom built single family in the GTA yeah. starts at 480 and it goes to 1050, which it just yeah. goes to show how yeah. wide the variability yeah. is now yeah i think what I, I like what you said you were comfortable saying you know in and around the 400 yeah all things considered yeah. and then yeah. you just see where this thing it's such a loaded question but yeah. if you want to talk about a baseline cost of like hey i'm thinking about this is this something in my wheelhouse or is this something i can afford start with four but understand that it can easily go up you know 30 percent. yeah and I, and I think that like I don't know the details of this, but but I would say that this number 480 doesn't include design or pre-construction. This is just pure construction costs. So you know you have you know fifty hundred thousand dollars there, right? Um, so I I think that uh, the number is is probably five hundred or more now um, as let's say like your base. But again, so many different um, uh, variables. Um, and in the end, yeah, you, you you do get what you pay for. Um, I mean, what what we try to do is is inform the clients. Or no, we try. We we do it. I mean, some people uh, they want the answer right away. So I think in that case, they're kind of just just looking for what something costs and maybe just just checking a price. Um, but um, yeah, there there is there is variability between builders. I mean we we construct you know finely crafted homes you know these are um you know the ultimate right when we're talking about net zero right comfort health durability technology um you know it's the latest in in design and engineering you know it's it's backed by science right like uh and then when we're talking about a job that we can control then we're talking about it's also backed by by the tear on warranty um yeah, and that's big. Yeah, and I, I yeah. don't think if you GC a house yourself, you get that, especially if you're some, especially if you're looking to sell it after, right? So that that's the big thing that people I think struggle with. Anybody that's buying, I just know from my own clients, if you're looking to buy a new home, new custom home that somebody else built, the first yeah. question is, is there warranty, right? Yes. Yeah. And that's where you run into issues because not all of them have warranty, right? Who built them and who's going to stand by that warranty? Yeah. And, and you know, it's... Uh it's not a, a nice to have it's 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 a legal requirement i mean i i actually talked to a homeowner back a year ago that bought a a, a home between 3 and 4 million dollars brand new home on the market um no warranty uh his Crazy. lawyer basically provided a a, a from the builder a, like a like a like a personal guarantee type of thing that's not allowed and he was not informed, right? So he kind of came to me saying, do we fix things like that? And I said, not really, but let me understand what happened here. So he ended up talking to Terion and the HCRA. So Terion's mandate was license builders and uh, back the warranty as the underwriter. Uh, their mandate got split. HCRA, so the Home Construction Regulatory Authority, they're now licensing builders um so he went to them and Tyrion. and Tyrion's covering it like i mean that's a new home that should be that's the law like that has to have a warranty attached to it uh so that, that like that's a that was a very frustrating for me early on like we started off developing a couple houses and selling them on the market and agents were asking what is Tyrion? i was like what are you asking me this like how don't you know this right and you know nine out of 10 homes on the market, they're staged, they're new, they're not lived in. They never had Terry on. And it was like in North York. Yeah. Terry on's office is at Young and Shepherd. <laughs> I was like, guys, just, just walk a few kilometers radius around here. You're going to find illegal builds everywhere. So, you know, when, when a builder is being vetted, you know, homeowners, they need to understand that's the law. They need to be licensed by the HCRA. 
Now, if they're a manager, they won't need to be because they're not in control of the job. But I always say, like, why why wouldn't they be, right? Um, but anyway, th that's that's up to the homeowner whether they're comfortable with that. Um, so they could always check on the builder with the HCRA's directory. There, there's an online portal that they can, and that, that screenshot is showing what, what our portal looks like. So, you know, they're going to show whether they're licensed, whether it's expired, uh, you know, and what the possessions have been in the last 10 years. And, you know, I think some homeowners will, homeowners will be surprised that, you know, some builders that, you know, I, I obviously check on my competition too. Some are not even licensed or they're expired or they have like zero possessions in the last 10 years. And I'm like, I, I, I just don't understand. I guess they're doing more renovations or they're doing more management type contracts, but they're not taking the financial, let's say liability uh, to, to have the warranty. So, um, you know, to get the license, the builder has to have competencies exhibited, you know, whether it's project management or legal uh, construction, obviously. Um, so, you know, they, they need to have those skills anyway, but anyway, some don't have the actual license. Uh, and they also have to have financial backing. You know, if there ever was an issue on, on the project that they're able to fix it. Um, so the homeowner can check all those things out um, on on HCRA's directory. Um, good, yeah, good to know. And look, I think just uh, anecdotally, I can say that just like Tridel is the Mercedes Benz of condos, let's say, and everybody respects yeah. them for their build quality. Yeah, been doing this, it for a long time, yeah. I, I can say that the same kind of applies for certain home builders in the city because I have seen homes advertised that hey, it was built by XYZ. Yeah. And if they have a good reputation, you, you know what, it, it carries yeah. it carries some weight rather than it was built by Joe down the street. Now, I understand that it's you're going to have both, but I'm just trying to explain to people that buying from a builder, especially if it's a reputable builder, I think it does carry a premium. Yeah. And, and you know, with everything, you, you know, you get what you pay for. Obviously, you have to make sure you're not overpaying. Uh, but at the same time, you know, uh, I would say getting deals uh, for, for a home is something that is, is a risky proposition. Um, you know, when you're dealing with the investment that you're putting into this, this is probably the biggest one-time purchase as well. Right. Yeah. Um, but you know, the other thing that the Terran warranty actually includes is $40,000 of financial loss protection. So if any time through the build, something happens with the builder, there's actually that, that $40,000 there too, uh, which, you know, some people don't know about they just think of the actual warranty protection after the fact you know the, the one year workmanship the two year you know building envelope and water penetration you know the seven year um uh, structural uh, uh warranty and just so people understand you know there's only one type of Terran warranty it's either for condos or for uh let's say a freehold um there, there's people I, I see some advertising so you know seven year premium tier on warranty well, you know that's the same warranty that any builder should be providing that. yeah well thank you so much this was very helpful no it's problem, awesome. Bas, uh, yeah if uh you know your clients have any other questions you know feel free to to contact me um and and i would just say that you know uh, uh, potential clients they, they need to vet the builders uh, uh, on all the you know the platforms I mentioned but also check their references and, and their past builds and just just talk to the people that they've done the work for so they can hear it firsthand. Yeah I think prior builds are probably where all the truth lies not in anything else because uh, just from my experience again you have to go to most recently completed projects get references from there see how things were built and I think you go from yeah. there. Yeah yeah exactly yeah. If you found this content valuable, please like and subscribe to the channel. And this gives me the feedback to know what kind of content you want to see. And as always, if you have any questions or you're unclear about something, you can always call me, text me, or email me. I'd be happy to help. I'll see you in the next one.